And today we're going to kind of talk about some of the transaction fees that we ran into. So when I started doing my thing with OpenSea yesterday, one of the things that ended up happening was we showed a, um, a transaction fee to get this into the network. So that was really kind of a surprise to me. And I'm like, well, why would there be a transaction fee? So I went and did a little bit of research on this, and it's really kind of interesting on how this actually works. So there's a place called Illcoin that actually has some really good ideas on what goes along with that transaction fee. And I kind of wanted to go over this article in depth with you because it's really kind of interesting on the things that they've had to do and why transaction fees are part of the whole process. So transaction fees are basically things that you um, are paying a crypto miner to add your block to their chain, right? So that's the interesting part on this one, right? What you're doing is you're basically paying for that service, and that service is essentially very, 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 very flexible in how much they charge you. So um, it's really kind of interesting because what they do is they say here is that miners are incentivized to put their transaction in front of the queue. So when you're basically bribing someone to um, get your stuff into the blockchain earlier or just on time or whenever. So you're basically paying for someone else's GPU or power time to get you into the system and you pay someone else to make your deposit into the blockchain for you. So that's really kind of interesting in that miners um, are not just making coin, they're actually charging fees to put your stuff into the chain. And that's another way of making money. It's probably really, really, really legit in terms of how it goes, but it was really kind of a surprise to me to see that they're incentivized to put their transaction in the front of the queue or yours, right? And these, these fees are charged everywhere. This is not a new thing here. Um, you can actually see in Coinbase that um, the cap fees are calculated at the time you place your order and determined by a combination of market factors, um, payment method, size of the order, and market conditions such as volatility and liquidity. Um, so it's really kind of interesting that when you take a look at how that whole process works, um, that you are going to pay a fee regardless of what you do. And that puts a barrier in here when you want to put your collection into the market. If you don't have that money, um, and it's basically going to be sitting here and doing its thing. So you go to sell it and you go to sell and you know they're going to actually ask you for that fee service fee of two and a half percent right and they'll go ahead and you have to have that in your um in your wallet and i don't have anything in my wallet yet so that's the interesting part you're basically paying for someone else's time on their gpu by these service fees right but that's the neat thing about it is that it also ended up that this was actually baked into the process and what's kind of interesting is that you know um, initially, transactions fees, you know, really weren't that that big. It was more of a way of deterring malicious actors from overloading the Bitcoin network. So it's kind of interesting. They're already at that point when they were starting this whole thing that, you know, we were worried about people overloading the network or people misusing the Bitcoin network for their own process. So when they went ahead and they did the hash cash system, which relied on proof of work, you ended up having that whole process of that transaction fee. And again, when Bitcoin was really small, it wasn't a big deal. But nowadays, you know, Bitcoin is like, well, what is it? It's like something like $47,000. So a minimum transaction fee of 0 0.01, you know, 1% of that is like 400 and some odd dollars. And that's a barrier to entry. That is a huge barrier to entry for most people that are doing small art or small artists. You know, if you already have that kind of money and you don't mind burning it, there you go. Um, having to pay a two and a half percent transaction fee um, can be really, really, really expensive depending on how much you're getting for what you want. But again, it's that whole idea of that transaction fee was really designed to deter malicious actors from overloading the network, but now it's become a barrier to entry. So it's really kind of something to think about if you're going to go make your own NFT, if you're going to go ahead and start buying and selling Bitcoin, just be ready for these transaction fees. And that is something that you need to be really aware of. Or go ahead and open up your own mining operation and make sure that you're on that side of it. Right now, the good place to be in terms of just keeping a regular income in is going to be in the mining operations right now. Um, just because you can work not just to your own advantage and making coin, but to your own advantage in terms of working on those service fees. Those service fees can actually really work out well, especially if you're asking two, $300 a, a pop, and there's a lot of them in a given day. 
So it's interesting how they go ahead, they break these things down, whether it's Bitcoin, um, whether it's Ethereum, whether it's something Ripple, so no miners generating coins. So um, just kind of think about what you're doing here when you get there and how much those transaction fees. Um, it doesn't really matter how much they're measured in, whether they call it gas or small fractions or proof of work or mempools or anything else. That doesn't matter. What really matters is the amount of money you have to spend on that transaction fee. And again, miners will select transactions with higher fees and leave the rest for the following block miners. So that's where this gets to be interesting. It's supply and demand. Um, very, very, very capitalistic on that viewpoint. And then transaction fees compare. So different blocks have different kinds of transaction fees. So they talk about a service here called Ripple. Um, because no one's in it, transaction fees are really, really super short, super small. But if you're in Bitcoin, you're in Ethereum, you know, those transaction fees can really get to be a lot higher um, you know you can talk about $99 fees and again when we were looking at this yesterday and we were looking at fees of around $220 to $230 um, and again you can do all this stuff right and this was interesting and demand for transactions a big problem right better fees to the system but the problem is is that um, yeah, if I can make $50,000 in a single hour doing that, I'm gonna. And yeah, I agree with, with this guy, Vitalik Buterin, expressed concerns that high fees could encourage selfish money practices. Darn straight, right? If I've got someone who's gonna pay me a lot of money to get their stuff in first, jump in front of the queue, you betcha I'm gonna go ahead and do that because, you know, $50,000 is a good honking profit right there. Not a problem. So these fees have really become an interesting part of the process. And now it's also becoming much more of a con controversy. Right. And that how do we make sure that these fees are fair and not a barrier to entry? Because, again, right now I'm not going to be doing anything with OpenSea because I don't have an extra two, three hundred dollars a transaction to get this into the system. I'm just just don't have it. And that's not that big a deal. But, you know, there it is. So some networks can contain only a limited amount of data in each block and blah, blah, blah. So transaction fee sizes, right? Basically, um, what makes this interesting is not just the amount of data in the block, the amount of miners that are in there and the amount of validators that are restricted on the number of transactions that they can, that they can include into a particular block. But when you're doing this a lot, that demand for block space increases. So you do have a finite limit right now in the amount of, of mining operations that are available to people right now to do stuff, to get them into the block, to make new coin. And depending on which one is more profitable to the person at the time, it may be more profitable to be mining coin, or it might be more profitable to be working off those service fees. So the person that's in charge of that mining operation is making these decisions on a day to day or probably hour to hour basis or maybe just splitting between the two. So that high demand for block space can make sure that that network gets a lot of congestion and then fees just bounce off to unsustainable levels. That's a great regulator that will kind of put a big handbrake on how much stuff is moving across the board right now. But again, it's that whole idea of barrier to entry as you kind of go along with it because on those cryptocurrency transactions, you really do need to think about this as that whole process in your cryptocurrency transaction that we really do have a break on the system and that there's a finite limit to the amount of processing power that's available to someone to do this. And yeah, that's where um, all this stuff is going to make a lot more interesting part of the process when it comes to working out how much your service fees are going to be. And again, it's really kind of straightforward if you wanted to see what your service fee was going to be. So let's just go ahead and do a price for six months of service fee. And then we can go ahead and look and complete that listing. And it should just pop up and tell me how much my service fee is going to be. Oh, well, my service fee now is 254 to 339 depending on Ethereum. And again, that's for a teeny tiny amount of, of an Ethereum thing. And, you know, please deposit this money because, again, I don't have it. Um, but again, you can kind of go through and check and see what those things are going to do, right? If you really wanted it fast and you really wanted to jump in there, you're going to pay the, the $250 to $350 to get it in there. Um, but if you just want normal or slow, you know, depending on what you got, right? These are barriers to entry. And you can actually change that speed out and move it down to how you want to do your, your whole process. So um, that's all. That's how that is going to work, right? And you can ask for that amount of money. Yeah, so we declined it, of course, and we just go from there. So those fees matter. Um, those fees are going to be the same depending on whether it's timed auction or whether it is a fixed price. So 
supply, demand, availability, liquidity, li liquidity, and everything else that goes into this, this is how you get your transaction fees um, done up. And it's pretty much the same, whether you use uh, Bitcoin, whether you use uh, um, any of these other Coinbase, whether you use any of these other things, all these transaction fees are basically how much it's gonna cost to get your money into the blockchain or get your process into the blockchain so that it can be bought and sold and, and moved around. And that's it for this lecture, just really kind of interesting aside, something I didn't expect when I was building out my, my thing yesterday. So um, just a neat way of looking at this and a neat understanding now that there are some interesting limitations in the Bitcoin network and the limitations in blockchaining and that they had to implement some handbrakes in there to, to limit the amount of damage that someone could do if they were a malicious actor in the network or just making sure that you can actually just get your way into the network um, as fast as possible or however long you wanted to get it in there. Uh, you know, me personally, I would be happy paying a, a $5 fee if it took you, if you did it sometime today, I'd be like totally happy with it. I don't need 10 second or 15 second or 45 second processes. I just need it done sometime soon. So maybe there's a market opening in there. I don't know. Um, could be interesting. Less fees, um, but for a slower return price. So that's it for this lecture. Do um, feel free to give me a shout back out and make sure that um, if you've got any questions that you put them in the comments. And again, remember to like, subscribe and all that good stuff. This is uh, part of uh, an interesting process of learning how Bitcoin works. So I'm really, really kind of glad that you're along for the ride. You all have a great day and thank you very much. Bye.